It wasn't long ago, uh, in fact, many of you, I'm sure, were here that we gathered uh, in this room to hear Lord Lamont and Mark Boliat, uh, among others, debate the pros and cons uh, of a Brexit vote. Given the heat uh, that that result generated, uh, the accusations of wildly false claims made by uh, both sides during the campaign, and the frequent references now to a post-trust democracy developing uh, in the wake of the referendum, we felt it fitting to host a debate that asks a slightly broader question about accountability in political campaigning. So tonight our motion uh, is as follows. The judiciary, not just parliament, must address breached election promises. Just a few very, very brief words from me, and then we'll, we'll let our uh, debaters get, their, get stuck into this. But we, we've had a little bit of a lull, or at least it felt a little bit of a lull for me with the bre Brexit chatter and the Brexit gossip, whatever you want to call it. But it seems to be firmly back in the headlines now. The PM met our cabinet uh, for the special session yesterday at Chequers. Uh, Brexit and how to, f how to achieve that was firmly on the agenda uh, there. Uh, debate over Parliament's right of veto and threats of legal action if it doesn't get it. Uh, are getting louder. No doubt we'll hear plenty more about uh, that tonight, especially from David Lammy, who memorably called on Parliament back in June to stop this madness. Uh, Baroness Wheatcroft has talked of the Lords thwarting Brexit, if it came to it. Uh, the People's Challenge to Article 50. I'm just running you through some of the latest news bits that I've read about. Whether the PM can trigger the procedure without full parliamentary approval is getting a lot of airtime right now. And that ch challenge is set to reach the High Court uh, sometime in October. Tonight, though, as I've said, um, we debate something a little bit broader, a little bit more evergreen uh, for us whether and how politicians can be forced to keep their promises. Um, many of you will recall the words of Ian Duncan Smith of Vote Leave shortly after the referendum. Our promises were a series of possibilities, he said. So should UK law be bolstered to protect the public from false claims during campaigns or should the responsibility rest with Parliament alone uh, is a question we are asking tonight. Our timing is good. Uh, just yesterday, the Electoral Reform Society released a, a, a pretty scathing, a pretty damning verdict of the referendum debate. Uh, they called for a, a, a root and branch review of how referendums are carried out. One of the recommendations uh, is for an official public body to get involved if misleading claims are made. Another, by the way, and it's good we've got Polly Toynbee here tonight as well to talk about this, or at least when we get into Q&A, is for Ofcom to address the influ influential role of the media in all of this. Um, of course, we've seen broken election promises result in legal action before, notably Wheeler versus the government back in 08. Again, no doubt we'll hear about that uh, this evening as well. Let me introduce uh, our debaters. As usual, two for, two against. They'll alternate their opening statements before we open it up to Q&A, and then the closing statements ahead of your chance to vote again. Uh, arguing for, I'll just run, run through everyone before I then uh, pull in the pre-debate pre vote. Arguing for the motion that the judiciary, not just parliament, must address breach election promises. The Right Honourable David Lammy MP, Member of Parliament for Tottenham. Uh, on the same side is Robert Palmer, barrister at Moncton Chambers, who practices in the field of uh, public, regulatory and EU law. Worth mentioning as well that Ian Rogers from Moncton, uh, I was trying to remember that name earlier, but Ian Rogers appeared on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Commonwealth in Wheeler versus the government back in 08. That was right, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, arguing against is Polly Toynbee, who, who you will all know, no doubt, a columnist from The Guardian, former social affairs editor at the BBC. She's written a lot about this. Uh, arguing with Polly is Dan Needle, partner at Clifford Chance, special, who specializes in tax law. Uh, he's keen to stress, by the way, that uh, anything he says comes from him and not Clifford Chance. He's covering himself. <laughs> Up to you whether you believe that or not. Um, uh, I believe Dan and Robert as well have found themselves uh, on opposing teams um, and, um, on the debating platform as well. Uh, Dan was at Bristol, uh, Robert was at Oxford, and I think uh, Dan says he won them all, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, right, let's get the results of the pre-debate vote. Um, here we go. Agree. So the judiciary, not just parliament, must address breached election promises. 63% of you uh, or thereabouts say yes. Um, the disagrees, about 11%, and the undecideds, 
uh, about 26% now. So again, as is most often the case in these debates, uh, you've got a lot to play for. Let's, uh, let's get straight to uh, our speakers. First up, arguing for the motion, um, David Lammy, MP. Uh, David, you've got eight to 10 uninterrupted minutes uh, at this podium. You'll then all do the same. David, the floor is yours. Look, I'm, I'm very conscious that I'm the only politician probably in the whole House uh, arguing that um, the judiciary should keep a keen eye on what I say. And so I should start by saying I have never, ever lied in my life. Um, I came here on the tube. It was packed. I walked up, ended up sitting on the floor. So, look, clearly there are occasions in which politicians... Um, usually in the run-up to a general election, put out a manifesto, make a set of promises. Um, and it, of course, it's the case that sometimes, occasionally, um, those promises aren't entirely kept, usually because of unforeseen circumstances, uh, you know, compromises, those sorts of things. But actually, this debate comes at a timely moment because the bottom line that I want you to keep in your mind is very simple. Is Britain amidst a constitutional crisis? And if you agree with me that Britain is in the middle of a constitutional crisis, it seems obvious to me that there is a role for the judiciary in the nature of our constitution, which is a separation of power and requires a judiciary to effectively arbitrate what is now a very difficult issue. It is not being written up as a constitutional crisis, and that is an issue for the media. Uh, and certainly the Prime Minister, who is absolutely on one side of the debate, is not presenting it as a constitutional crisis. But my view is that it absolutely is a constitutional crisis for these reasons. I voted uh, to have a referendum. And in voting to have a referendum, I read very carefully the House of Commons library briefing that sort of sits with members of parliament or sits with the sort of explanatory notes and the bill as you, as you, as you go in uh, and, and decide whether in fact there should be a referendum. And this is what the uh, library notes of the Commons said. The European Referendum Act does not contain any requirement for the UK government to implement the results of the referendum, nor set a time limit by which a vote to leave the EU should be implemented. This is a type of referendum known as a pre-legislative or consultative referendum, which enables the electorate to voice an opinion. I.e., this referendum is not binding. It's an advisory referendum. We've had them before. Uh, we had them in Manchester um, a, a few years ago on whether there should be a referendum, for, a referendum to have a new mayor, and the people of Manchester voted against it, and we're now foisting Andy Burnham on them. <laughs> um, he's a great guy, but uh, the government decided, forget that, we're doing it anyway. Um, and of course, we've had advisory referendums in Scotland, in Wales, in Northern Ireland in relation to their different types of devolution settlement. We did have a binding um, referendum, and that was um, the 2011 referendum, which you probably all remember, of course, uh, on whether we should change first past the post to a more PR system, effectively the alternative vote system, and the British people resoundly decided that they didn't want to change except for the people of Hackney, Haringey, Brighton, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and that's about it. So we didn't change that system. But the point is, most serious democracies, if you are handing big decisions over the electorate, would insist, I think in this context, on two things. One, you would say there has to be a two-thirds majority. The second, I think you would say in relation to the UK, is there has to be a quadruple lock. You have to have England, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland in the same place on such a profound constitutional decision of this kind. Yet, despite that, of course, on the steps of Downing Street, um, just after the referendum, uh, David Cameron turned a non-binding referendum into a binding <laughs> referendum 
and that has been the case um, ever since. The transition from an advisory referendum to a binding referendum and the transformation from a parliamentary democracy to something that's altogether completely different. So where are we now and why? Do you want the judiciary? Or why should we want the judiciary to get involved? Well, none of us know what Brexit looks like, what form it will take, when it's going to happen. We don't know whether our future lies within a single market or outside of it. Uh, we don't know what our trading relationships with Europe or with the rest of the world are going to be. Um, uh, we aren't armed with the civil servants uh, in Whitehall to help us deal that. In fact, we're at this present moment, uh, handing over much of that capacity to consultancy firms and firms like Clifford Charts, I understand, to help us determine. And we may well be bringing in professionals from across the world, uh, countries like India and South Africa that have to, have to negotiate arrangements. I mean, it's kind of bizarre. We're, we're actually going to increase immigration in order to help <laughs> us get the officials to, to deal with the issue. Of course, and we're not also part of the WTO as it stands uh, at the moment. And David Davis can say what he likes about, uh, I think he said something about having a sort of tariff-free access to the single market. Europe's playing hardball about this decision. That's the context that we have. Um, and yet, uh, we have a prime minister that wants to literally, we've not really seen this since, uh, you know, I think it was James II, uh, with the flick of a pen, move Article 50. So my view is this absolutely is something that requires um, uh, judicial uh, oversight. I might say also the dangers of plebiscite is absolutely something that requires lawyers to engage in. There are very, very sound reasons why we don't live in a country that routinely conjures up images of Ridley Scott's gladiator. And indeed, uh, you know, other than the decision to Brexit, there was, a, there was um, uh, the National Environment Research Council um, wanted to name its new polar research ship um, over the course of the summer. And you, you might remember that it sort of asked people, what should we name our, our new Arctic exploration research ship? And of course, the British people voted and thought about it, and they came up with Boaty McBoatface. Uh, which was, was dropped and now turned into the sort of David Attenborough um, <laughs> uh, 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 boat instead. So it's for those reasons and very serious ones that we saw at their most acute in the run-up to the Second World War with the way in which Hitler used um, referendum and plebiscites to to get his way effectively, that actually we have a parliamentary democracy in which we ask MPs to make those decisions and ultimately, for that reason, obviously there's some sympathy that this should come back to Parliament and others will argue that case. But profoundly, parliamentarians lied routinely during this particular run-up. You remember the 350 million that you were going to get in the NHS? Uh, you remember that Syria and Turkey are about to uh, join the EU despite signing no chapters at all to, 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 to come into the European Union. And you remember the false claims that were made routinely about immigration. And for all of those reasons, against that backdrop, this is not just about the way public officials misuse their, their office in order to trick the electorate, and there are laws that exist in relation to that. It's not just about potentially criminal fraud. My view is that there should be a new law. Parliament should pass a new law so that the judiciary really can examine whether truths have been told or not in any election cycle. I rest my case. Thank you. David Lemmy, thank you very much uh, indeed. Up next, arguing against the motion is Polly Toynbee. Polly, uh, eight to ten minutes. Thank you. Uh, well, I entirely agree that Britain has just been lied to outrageously by politicians to the everlasting, I fear, detriment of the nation. I don't think ever a single issue has mattered so much, yet never has a group of politicians put forward such flagrant, deliberate, knowing untruths. Uh, as David said, the promise of the red Brexit 
battle bus of 350 million a day for the NHS was denounced twice by Sir Andrew Dilnot, chair of the UK Statistics Authority, and they played not a blind bit of notice. And they lied again about uh, with it, saying we had no right to stop 70 million Turks massing on our borders, when of course we had a veto on new e EU entrants. They promised we can have our cake and eat it, all the icing, uh, with none of the responsibilities. And I fear we're going to go on hearing that from Brexiters, uh, as their mendacious, and in their mendacious press, already talk crooky about betrayals, even as we enter negotiations where it's pretty plain as a pike staff that the other 27 countries have no intention of giving us what Theresa May yesterday pretended would be a unique British cake and eat it, eat it model. Oh, I would cheerfully, as would David Hang, Boris Johnson, and the rest of the mendacious <laughs> Brexit campaigners high on that zip wire with waving flags and leave them there forever for the willful lies that they told. Dante would have found a special circle in hell for politicians <laughs> of their stamp. You have to remember that the same people who ran the Brexit campaign also ran, as David mentioned, the equally abominable No to AV campaign they took a modest proposal for a slight electoral reform and pretended the trifling extra cost would end up taking precious funds away from kit for our boys in Afghanistan and deprive NHS babies of incubators. But no, I still wouldn't take them to court, not even for their crimes against the truth. Would I put us through the long, drawn-out legal wrangle over when is a lie is a lie, when is it exaggeration? When is it poetic license? And how far can a politician go in the arts of persuasion? It would do no one any good, except, of course, all of you lawyers. <laughs> and my learned friend, Mr. Lammy, is one of those two, so he had a natural penchant for the courtroom. But that way lies Jarndyce v. Jarndyce over virtually everything of importance in politics. And judges themselves, wise as they are, are not that keen. You might think, at the very least, that this sort of thing is a matter for the Advertising Standards Authority, the ASA, but no, even they won't touch politics. You can't legally promise a slimming product that'll create the body of a supermodel or a sip of herbal tea that will bring eternal youth, but politicians can legally advertise any promises they like on matters of considerably more importance. Says the ASA, for reasons of freedom of speech, we do not have a remit where the purpose of the ad is to persuade voters in elections. And quite right, too. The ASA would be doing little else if they did. The Electoral Reform Society today has called for an official body to intervene in elections over misleading claims. Good idea, but good luck to them with that. And good luck to <laughs> Ofcom, too, if they want to put their oar in. Politics is an art, and I happen to think that, on the whole, it's an honourable one. I'm very much a supporter of David Lammy's profession, or perhaps trade. Overly despised <laughs> and traduced. It's been an oddity since the dawn of democracy when rude graffiti about politicians were scrawled all over the pillars of ancient Greece, that while democracy itself is regarded as sacred, a cause to live and die for, we always despise its actual practitioners who plead for our votes. Until the hacking scandal, politicians used to score below journalists in, in public trusts, but now they've moved one notch lower. But we're both down there, basically, amongst the debt collectors and the estate agents. And, uh, and the lawyers. Let's hang the lawyers, as uh, Shakespeare famously said. Uh, nonetheless, politics is an art, and most people who go into it, bar the occasional sociopath with blonde hair, do it because they want to help to make the country run better as they see it. Most would get far better jobs doing something else. It's pretty thank thankless. Almost everyone hates them. You should see their letters and emails. But I'm here to support, David. To do any good at all, you have to get elected. Something Labour membership seems to have temporarily forgotten. <laughs> to get elected, you need to persuade a majority of people in the country that your vision of the future is better than the other sides. And visions are needed, even if you know the reality is really rather more mundane. To do that, you need to paint pictures of where you would like to go, what you stand for, what you hope for, lifting people's eyes to the hills at least a bit. And that means politicians tend to ride to power on the backs of unicorns. So where does truth come into it? That's for voters to detect. Caveat emptor. I would say voters don't 
sufficiently full, fulfill their basic duty as citizens, first of all to vote, but also to arm themselves with basic information. Click of a mouse on trusted web websites such as the admirable BBC will simply and concisely tell them all they need to know. But if you've ever been out canvassing, you will be as shocked as me by the utter ignorance of well enough educated people who should know better. But voters in a representative democracy are not looking for specific policies, for which, uh, but for which of the two parties, our monstrous uh, electoral system doesn't allow more, looks most plausibly competent as a government to represent the current mood of the country. Manifestos may be laid out like shopping lists, but virtually nobody reads them, and voters mostly know little of specific policies on offer. They're choosing a party and its leader. They're not shopping, not signing a contract, Politicians who treat them as shoppers, bribing them with cheap tax cuts and bonuses, uh, usually get it wrong. For the losing side to take the winners to court years later for failure to keep a manifesto promise misses the point of politics. True, it's unwise of parties to deliberately promise specific things that they won't deliver. Sometimes it's even unwiser for a government to stick to promises they should never have made. Referendums, I hope we've now learnt, are the very worst kind of democracy encouraging the most extreme overclaiming. Politics has recently sat, sunk even lower in public trust. I can see why an ill-advised attempt to hold ministers' feet to the fire in court over their election promises might look like the way to keep them honest. But the idea, that idea belongs with a recent trend in passing laws designed to handcuff governments by law to their own commitments, and it hasn't worked. They probably undermine trust even further. In a last desperate throw of the dice, Gordon Brown in 2010, just before the election, introduced the Fiscal Responsibility Act, binding himself to iron targets on national debt and deficit. Plainly, voters didn't believe Labour. A year later, Gordon, uh, George Osborne brought in his own Budget Responsibility Act to legally chain himself to balance the books and limit the budget, limit the whole deficit by 2017. Well, that worked well, didn't it? And he slipped the handcuffs cuffs almost at once and repeatedly changed the date. So should we go to court to demand these ridiculous laws are kept? Of course not. What money there is in the Treasury, how it's gotten spent according to the state of the economy, must be left to the best judgment of the Chancellor of the day, not to the courts. Tony Blair broke a rash promise to hold a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. I wish that Cameron had broken his promise on the EU referendum. We've got about a minute. Maybe Nick Clegg should have been arraigned for breaking his promise with a flourish of a publicly signed vow never to raise tuition fees, but the courts would never have delivered a verdict as satisfyingly damning as that of the voters who punished him utterly, and now his entire political party fits in a people carrier. <laughs> uh, I am, of course, entirely in favour of people's rights to get existing law fairly applied. Legal aid cuts have been shockingly deprived the neediest of their due right to claim what Parliament has decreed they're entitled to. That's another matter. I do understand why David and others have gone to law over triggering Article 50. Oddly, for the purposes of this argument, they're actually calling for the primacy of Parliament to decide, and I agree with that. Article 50 petition says referendum is only advisory, been signed by a thousand lawyers, so it must be right. But it also suggests to me why lawyers get things wrong. The people have spoken, whatever the law says, and at least for now, they want out. Though, of course, no one knows what out means, and the phrase Brexit means Brexit is entirely meaningless. So uh, I hope, David, that you win on triggering Article 50. But nevertheless, the 1972 European Communities Act has to be repealed by Parliament anyway, and I think we are due for years of excruciating debate, just like Jarndyce v. Jarndyce on the floor of the House of Commons, about every detail of the trade negotiations. But that's where it should be, better there than in the courts. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Uh, bang on 10 minutes. Robert Palmer is arguing for the motion. Uh, together with David. Robert, uh, the floor is yours, eight to ten minutes. Thank you, Axel. David has spoken already of the problem, the crisis in democracy which has given rise to a post-trust politics. And he's spoken of the need for the judiciary to play its part in restoring confidence in parliamentary democracy. So I'm going to focus on how can the judiciary play that part. I'm going to concentrate on 
enforcing election promises, not referendum arguments. First, let me acknowledge the limitations of the judiciary's role. The courts cannot uh, and should not usurp parliament and become a legislator. And they cannot and should not seek to limit free speech, least of all the freedom of speech of those seeking election to parliament. Now, even the 68% of you who are for us at the beginning will agree with that much. And if I were to suggest the contrary, that lawmaking should be left to sensible lawyers and wise judges to sort out, not mendacious, career-driven, expenses-claiming politicians, uh, present company accepted, you would explain that I am a naive fool, but you would treat me kindly. You would patiently explain that, unlike Parliament, uh, judges are unelected and have no mandate either to legislate or to govern. It's the mandate that is important, you would explain. For government and lawmaking must be based upon the consent of the electorate. And if I were to suggest that the court should censor electoral candidates' promises to remove those which the judges consider are unrealistic or unviable or even ill-advised, like um, a cable car over the River Thames or an airport island in the Thames estuary or Brexit, um, you would kindly tell me kindly that politicians' electoral promises must be subjected to the white heat of public debate and media scrutiny, and if unrealistic, unviable, unwise, for that to be exposed. And that's what John Humphreys is there for, Jeremy Paxman, Polly Toynbee. So all of that can be taken for granted uh, and readily conceded uh, to the opposition in much of the terms that Polly outlined. But all of that also exposes the problem. For once elected, we must assume that the government, the elected government, does have a mandate to do what it promised. And the mandate attaches to the manifesto upon which the successful party was elected. I'm not ready, like Polly, to dismiss the manifesto as worthless and irrelevant and almost a distraction because no one reads it. Because in truth, it's the media who extract from that manifesto the main policy pledges which give attention to what each, po each party uh, is standing for. And so it's that manifesto which gives the elected government a legitimacy, or in the co case of a coalition, a coalition agreement forged from the two parties' respective manifestos. And there follows an expectation that the government will follow that programme uh, and not some other secret, undisclosed programme. Now, that doesn't mean the government has to get its way. You know, Parliament may not pass the legislation the government wants if it doesn't like it, regardless. And you'll be conscious, of course, of the Salisbury Convention that the House of Lords will not ultimately stand in the way of a manifesto commitment although it might flex its muscles and block something which wasn't in the manifesto. Uh, and events may intervene that change the picture, which affect the wisdom of a particular promise. And whether we have personally voted for that party to form the government or not, we recognise, though, that a manifesto is as close a guide as may exist for an expression of the people's will, so far as events can be foreseen at the time of the election. And the government enjoys that mandate, even if we personally think some of the contents of the manifesto are unwise or, or, or silly. But there is a flip side to that as well. By the same token, that the government's mandate must be respected by others, so must the government respect the mandate that the electorate has given to it. So, for example, if a party runs for election on the basis of a commitment that it will not carry out any more pointless top-down NHS reorganisations, it cannot claim that it has a mandate then to carry one out. Quite the reverse. Having given the electorate a promise that it will not do so, it has a positive mandate not to do so. Or if, for example, a party promises no ifs, no buts, no third runway at Heathrow, and further promises not only to cancel plans for Heathrow's third runway, but also to refuse permission for additional runways at Gatwick and Stansted, it has a positive mandate to cancel those plans and refuse such permission. Uh, that's part of the basis upon which it could claim to have the consent of the electorate to govern. And so it would be quite inconsistent with that, for example, to set up an airports commission with express terms of reference charging the commission uh, to examine the scale and timing of requirement for additional capacity 
explicitly to maintain the UK's position as Europe's most important aviation hub, which can only have one answer. We need more capacity, either at Heathrow or Gatwick, at <coughs> Stansted, or some uh, combination. And this is where the courts can have a role, without purporting to legislate themselves and without silencing freedom of expression. Because commitments made by a party seeking power in an election deserve to be treated as no more and no less than giving rise to legitimate expectations in exactly the same way as statements by a public authority, whether the government or any other public authority, are treated by the courts as giving rise to legitimate expectations already. Uh, what that means, of course, as Lord Justice Laws has explained in Nadaraja and has been often repeated by the courts, is not that you cannot depart from a promise, not that you're bound for all time, whatever the change of circumstances, but that if you are going to break a promise, you must have good reason to do so. And in particular, it must be fair to do so, and it must be proportionate to affected interests to do so. And the court will arbitrate. It will arbitrate as to the terms in which the promise was given. So notwithstanding Polly's concerns, that's already being done. What the scope of a promise given by a public authority is, is already being interpreted. Whether that the policy will depart from it, and whether it is fair and proportionate to do that. That's already being done. That's the classic doctrine of legitimate expectation. So why shouldn't that equally apply to a solemnly given election promise on the basis of which, in part, a government can claim to have been elected and to enjoy the consent uh, of the electorate. So what that means is if a government does have to decide to break a promise, and if someone is aggrieved by that, they can take that to court and say, look, we had a legitimate expectation that you would not uh, seek to build new airport capacity in the southeast, or that you would not do a top-down reorganisation of the NHS. What that would mean, if the court considers that's arguable, is that the government would have to produce evidence. It would have to produce a witness statement explaining, setting out in black and white, in public record terms, what the considerations are which has led it to abandon a promise that it made. And that could be cross-examined in principle. It would be interesting. And the court can determine, then, whether or not there is sufficient justification about a minute. And Robert. none of that requires a radical departure from legal uh, principle. Brexit, on one interpretation, may be seen as a vote inspired by, uh, among other things, an expression of distrust in a remote liberal elite adrift from the concerns of the general election. So consider the words then, these words of the then Prime Minister promising a referendum. It's time to resolve once and for all whether this country, Britain, wants to be at the centre and heart of European decision-making or not. Time to decide whether our destiny lies as a leading partner and ally of Europe or on its margins. Let the Eurosceptics whose true agenda we will expose make their case. Let those of us who believe in Britain and Europe make our case too. Let the issue be put and battle be joined. Words which you will recognise at once as being those of Prime Minister Tony Blair in April 2004, uh, promising a referendum that didn't come. And of course, Stuart Wheeler's challenge uh, to that broken promise was dismissed for a number of reasons, but one of them being that the issue of a referendum lay so deep in the macro political field that the court should not enter into this area at all. It's time for that to change. Election promises have to be given special status, not consigned to an inaccessible macro-political field. It's time for politicians to know that if they make a solemn promise to the electorate, it will not be lightly dismissed, they will be held to account, and a simple flouting of the will of the electorate will no longer be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert Palmer. Right, finally uh, arguing against is uh, Dan Needle from Clifford Chance. Thank you. And I should probably start by saying that I do not represent Clifford Chance. I barely represent myself. Um, <laughs> but I do, I do, Mr Chairman, want to talk about three things. First and most importantly, I want to defend lying, the politician's sacrosanct right to lie to break their promises. Um, I want to talk about tedious questions of practicality. I am, after all, a tax lawyer. Um, I also want to talk about the judiciary and how the politicisation that the proposition think can be avoided. In fact, can't. We need some examples. Take, take 2005, the election. 
Labour's commitment to their fiscal rule. They would keep net debt stable. Of course, the financial crisis meant that that commitment was spectacularly broken. The bailout of RBS, the bailout of Lloyds, the bailout of, of Northern Rock. And if that commitment had not been broken, we would have seen a run on the banks. We would have seen a catastrophic financial crisis dwarfing the catastrophe that we did, in fact, get. Now, I can see uh, maybe the proposition looked a little bit unhappy at that. We heard that events are permissible. Um, there is an excuse for a politician when faced with a court order uh, for breaking his promise that events mean that it really wasn't his fault. But the problem is, Mr. Palmer, how do you judge that? You gave the example of Tony Blair's promise for a referendum on the European Constitution. That was the matter on which Mr. Wheeler litigated. But at the time that Mr. Wheeler brought his action, it was no longer a constitution. It had been radically changed. It was now the Lisbon Treaty. Was that an event that meant you didn't have to stick to your promise? Or was it not? Should Blair have been forced to keep to it? So how would that have been resolved when on 14 September 2007, queues started building up outside Northern Rock? What would we have done? Would we have gone to court to settle the matter? Would Mr. Palmer have patiently waited in the queue outside Northern Rock until the courts had spoken? Would, would we have seen a government decision followed by months and months of litigation with the entire fate of the economy hanging over the country? It doesn't seem to make sense. So let's take a less dramatic example. Let's take the Tories' 2010 commitment to repeal the European Convention on Human Rights, which I believe didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Because the Tories went into coalition with the Lib Dems. And the Tories gave that up. In return, the Lib Dems gave up kind of everything. But <laughs> the point is that if we adopt the proposition, coalition government becomes impossible. And what when a manifesto promise turns out to be unwise? Take the Tories' pledge to halve the deficit. Now, not just to halve the deficit, but to halve the deficit whilst keeping health spending, education spending, and defence spending, and one other, I forget, level. Of course, they couldn't do it. They knew they couldn't do it. They dropped it. But the proposition is suggesting that promises have to be kept no matter how foolish, no matter how unwise they later turn out to be. What about Parliament, Mr Chairman? What when Parliament refuses to enact a manifesto promise? Perhaps a party is split. Perhaps the government's majority is too small. Perhaps MPs, I know this is a bit ridiculous, use their independent minds and decide that actually a proposal doesn't make sense. What, what, what happens then? So what we really have here is a proposal for government on autopilot. You write the manifesto, it's then enacted, come hell, high water, recession, subject to lengthy court arguments about subsequent events. Is government as a, as a clockwork toy? Parliament is just sitting there devoid of all purpose. You, the courts are the referees, the MPs may be a linesman, nothing more. Is that really a democracy we want, Mr Chairman? But... I can see the proposition think I'm being a bit unfair. Maybe there is a way that we can square the circle. Maybe we can make everybody happy. And I have a solution. My solution is loyally caveats. Let's go back to the Labour Party 2005 posters. They, they read something like, the government will keep its fiscal rule and only borrow to invest. How can we make that work? Well, we can add in small types something like, as long as that's economically feasible in the context of wider geopolitical and economic events, subject to the Labour Party and the majority to govern in its own right, provided Labour MPs voted according to the manifesto, and past performance is no guide to future performance. <laughs> um, uh, and Mr Chairman, all we need to do is apply that approach to all political campaigning. You could have every speech with 100 pages of caveats. You, you could have websites you could only view once you sign a letter of engagement. Uh, Every part of political broadcast would end with five minutes of very small scrolling text. Uh, and then we would achieve nirvana. All events would be catered for, all promises would be kept, but of course the slight, the tiny disadvantage is those promises would be meaningless. I I in the end, you cannot square the circle, you cannot make this proposal work. So that's the first problem. Sometimes we want, we need promises to be broken, and we don't want the courts to be arbitrating that. And the difficulty is, that it's very easy to allege that a promise has been broken. I remember before the 2010 election, the Tories put out a list of 27 broken Labour manifesto promises. Not to be outdone, in 2015, the Labour Party beat that with a list of 50 broken Tory promises. And then, clearly, there was some inflation. This year, in the Scottish elections, Labour had a list of 100 broken SNP manifesto pledges. So it will always be very easy to make a prima facie argument that a manifesto promise has been broken. Some of them may be great arguments, some of them may be weak arguments, but lawyers will gladly accept all arguments, and each of them will become a lawsuit. 
They imagine Heathrow suing the government for failing to reach a decision when they said they would on the third runway. The Taxpayers Alliance suing the government for failing to re reduce the deficit and therefore lower taxes. Uh, the, it's a gift to lawyers, but it's also a gift to the wealthy, the fanatic, the unhinged. And, and, and for the record, none of my clients fall in that category. But <laughs> the, the nature of these allegations of lying is they all rest on very fine, narrow, subjective judgments. And these are judgments that should be in the hands of voters and MPs. The, the lies that were told during the referendum campaign, Mr. Lamy, it was to you and the others to answer them. And, and the failure of politicians to answer them, and the failure of the public to recognize what is true and what is false, well, that's a failure of democracy. We cannot look to judges to cure that failure. Now, it's true, as has been said, the British courts have been careful not to pass judgment on matters of high politics. They've gone out of their way not to. So the 1990 attempt by local authorities to block the poll tax failed. The 1997 challenge against the government's abolition of the assisted places scheme failed. And as we've heard, Stuart Wheeler's challenge um, against the lack of a referendum on Lisbon also failed. The proposition want to change it. They want to thrust the courts into the most contentious political issues. Now, Tony Benn famously said he'd ask those in positions of power, what power have you got, to whom are you accountable, and how can I get rid of you? He oddly failed to ever ask Saddam Hussein this question, but, but we, can be, we, we can be more consistent. And of course, the answers for today's proposal are really obvious. What power will the courts have? Everything, even maybe the power to overturn elections. To whom are they accountable? Nobody. How can we get rid of them? Well, of course, we can't. And, and that lies the by, and the only way to fix this is to make the courts more accountable and more representative. And you could see how you could do this with the best of intentions. You'd say, well, if we're giving the courts this power, then clearly they can't just be a bunch of old white men. We have to make the judiciary more representative. We have to bolster the Judicial Appointments Committee. We can't wait 50 years, so we're going to have to retire some judges now. And we're, we're going to need some public oversight. And all this is done with the best of intentions. And what you end up with is America. You, 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 end up, you, you end up with a politicized judiciary. And you, you really have a choice. You, you, you could do that uh, with all the disadvantages that everybody here is familiar with, or you don't do that, and you have an unrepresentative judiciary lording it over MPs, lording it over Parliament, lording it over the voters. Both choices are awful. The solution, of course, is to reject the proposition. I, 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 in the end, despite the riches this proposal would bring for lawyers everywhere, despite the hundreds of pages of caveats I would spend hours happily writing. It, About a minute, end, Dan. Thank you. It, 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 in the end, democracy is down to us. And failures in our political debate are down to us. They're down to the media, they're down to politicians, they're down to us collectively. We cannot solve this by magic. We cannot find someone so perfect that they can arbitrate these decisions that we ourselves are unable to, and we certainly can't look to judges to do it. No one in the world, to my knowledge, except the Americans, has gone to that extreme. When they have, it has ended very unhappily. We, ladies and gentlemen, should not follow in those footsteps. I beg to oppose. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers. Look, we've got a little bit of time. I mean, it, it's difficult for me. You know, I, sit, I, sit very, I have to sit very much on the fence here, and it was difficult for me during the Brexit debate uh, as well, um, because my uh, opinion really isn't relevant tonight, as I always say. But um, the, let, let me open this up. for We've got about 10, 10 minutes or so for some questions from the audience. So do challenge what you've heard uh, on both sides, uh, if you could. Uh, and you guys also, you've got 10 minutes to have a go at each other, really, with some of the points that you've heard. And then I'll let you uh, get into your closing uh, statement. So let's, let's have some questions uh, from the floor. Yeah, we'll start uh, with the lady right here, and then we'll come to the gentleman there. I was, um, I'd like to ask Robert, really, about uh, the question of manifesto promises. Because if there was a law in place that manifesto promises alone could be challenged, it wouldn't take many lawyers to find a way of making them so anodyne that they couldn't possibly be challenged. And I th the, the other point I'd like to make is that the um, Brexit debate highlighted that actually people couldn't care less about what the uh, underlying issues were. They, made a, a, they voted about something completely different. We didn't have manifestos for the Brexit debate, so we don't know what we voted for if we voted leave, or indeed, well, I suppose we knew what we voted for if we voted remain. So, and that didn't matter to people because they didn't care. 
I absolutely don't agree with the people don't care uh, analysis, and I won't settle for it, and I don't think we should settle for it. There are some people who don't care, of course, but it, it's a wild generalization to say people don't care. I, I'd be hard pushed to find anyone in this room who'd say, I don't care, and, and beyond that. We must distinguish, as I said at the outset, between referendum arguments, which all go to a proposition, whether should we vote yes, should we vote no, should we vote leave, should we vote remain, and the motion that we're concerned with today, which is about election promises, which come across a broad, diverse to promise, this is our program, this is what we are going to do. Not why we're going to do it, well, there might be some of that, but this is substantively our election program. Now, your first point was that that might be watered down and become anodyne by clever lawyers. Parties have got to mean what they say. If they come up with something so completely anodyne, saying we're not really going to do it, we might do it, or we're thinking about doing it, then the public will realise that it's not a wholehearted commitment. But if, for political reasons, they want to make a wholehearted commitment, say, absolutely, watch my lips, uh, no third runway, no new taxes, watch my lips. <laughs> whatever, it may, whatever it may be, then they should be prepared on that particular platform, not in a sort of random hurly-burly of what might be said on question time or anything, but on the specific published programme put out to the electorate to digest, to digest they should be able to be held account to it, not so that, as Dan suggested, therefore they must follow it, even if it turns out to be a thoroughly bad idea. But if they don't, they are held to account, and if it's challenged, if a failure to, to go through the promise is challenged, they have to be the ones, for example, on tuition fees we mentioned, to say, I know we said that, I mentioned the Lib Dems have been elected as a pure government and then abandoned that, that pledge, I know we said that, but here are the sums which demonstrate why we cannot do it, and... Uh, and then they are exposed in that black and white way uh, to, to that political cost. But, 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 right. Rob, but, but Rob, you, you say politicians won't be stuck to their promises if they turn out to be a really bad idea. Who makes that judgment? The, the, the judges, the courts. Well, no, Everything becomes no. litigated. Uh, uh, ultimately, the politicians are themselves, in the first instance, making the, their, their, their own judgment that, that they are not going to follow their own promise. So that is their own judgment. But what they've got to show to a court in exactly the same way, and this is the point you ignored throughout your entire presentation, Dan, uh, in exactly the same way that they must do so in respect of any promise which they give when in government. Because when they're in government, it's absolutely textbook student stuff. That if they give a, a, an explicit promise on a point, that will give rise to a legitimate expectation that can be litigated, and it will be for the court to decide whether or not it is fair to permit the decision maker to depart from that legitimate but, but, expectation. But so the question so for you is why take a different approach, Dan, with an election it's manifesto? It's not a different commitment? approach. On questions of high politics, the politician statements are not subject to legitimate expectation. If the Prime Minister gets up today and says that she will enact a law that paints the House of Commons pink and she does not do it, there is no legitimate expectation it's raised not, by a... The, the point is, it's not, a, it's not questions of high politics. It's a manifesto. It, it's a, it's a programme of office for which the public has a legitimate expectation. Uh, I mean, it's also the case that I think we probably are able to work out in common law a threshold uh, through which the courts would get involved. And I would suspect that the threshold would be quite high. And actually, and also to do this, it may be that you need to come back to Parliament to actually legislate specifically for the court to have a remit. So uh, is that impossible? Of course, it's not impossible. In the age of Facebook and Twitter, it's necessary. Let's take the case that you brought up. You're a very good one. You said the Tories promised there would be no top-down NHS reorganisation. And then they did the most massive organisation there had ever been. But, hang on a minute, they said it was a bottom-up no, up renegotiation. <laughs> they said this was putting power into the hands of GPs to set up CCGs, and it would all gravitate from the bottom to the top. Now, think of the wonderful legal argument you could have going on for years about what that disastrous organisation actually was meant was meant to be, should have been. Any, had anybody worked it out beforehand? No. It was just a line in a manifesto. And I can't see where, productively, that would get anywhere. I mean, I would quite like to introduce them for the ca catastrophe that they imposed on the NHS, but it wasn't quite about whether or not it was a top-down reorganisation. All right. Sorry, you want to say something very quickly? Well, you can, very very quickly. You, you can argue over any specific promise and say, well, what would the courts make of that one? The question is a larger one, which is one of principle, which is should this be able to be something which is entertained by the courts at all? Which is what we're debating tonight. Right. 
Okay. I've listened to the debate with interest, but I think at the end of the day, the problem is you can expose this to absurdity. What steps is a court going to take to enforce against a politician that's broken a promise? Is the politician going to be put in jail? <laughs> is the politician going to be found, fined millions of pounds? Are the judges going to have to take over the burden of running a political program, which they're not equipped to do, <laughs> yeah. do not have the resources to do? The thing is quite absurd, and it's just nonsense. How, how is it going to happen? How, tell us how it's going to happen. On ordinary judicial review principles, which doesn't involve anyone going to prison, any fines, anything of that kind, it involves individual decisions being quashed, injunctions or mandatory orders being made, standard administrative law principles. But here, you wouldn't be quashing something. You'd be creating an act of parliament. You'd well, be legislating. No, no, that's what I was careful to say. They wouldn't be legislating. I mean, the precise circumstances will differ from case to case because there could be a promise to legislate, which the judges can't do. But what they could do is say, you must introduce a... Unless you've got good reason not to, which in 9 out of 10 cases may well be the case, as, as with the current application of legitimate expectation claims. They mostly fail, but they are there. They sometimes succeed, and they are there in principle you must introduce this proposal. You must at least let the House of Commons have a say on this because you were elected as a government on the basis that you would let the House of Commons have a say on this. And if the House of Commons then vote it down, I have no problem with that at all. That's what parliamentary democracy is. You mean they put forward a bill, a Prime Minister is obliged to put forward a bill and have his own party and, of course, the opposition vote it down. Is that, that's the outcome of this whole huge paraphernalia. That's madness. No, because not every government action requires a parliamentary legislation. That's the first point. But the second point is even in the case where the parliamentary legislation is required, you can perfectly put forward a motion to Parliament to allow a vote in the House of Commons, even though you don't support it, or allow opposition time. Or do, there's endless scope for creativity. At the very least, what you'd have to be doing is saying, I know we said this in this manifesto, but now I'm going to face the political embarrassment of having to stand up and explain why I'm breaking my promise. OK, every example yep. today that we've all discussed has involved an act of parliament. No, Heathrow, for example. Heathrow, Sorry, it, would take a private, it would take a private act of parliament. But it might ultimately, but not the decision and policy as to where you want a third runway to go and whether you're going to permit it all right. at all. What often happens in these debates is that it actually makes you question the way in which the question is framed. And that is exactly what happened to me here. We're talking about breached election promises. Yet, when the debate started, David Lamy referred to various statements of fact, which turned out just not to be true, a bit like the weapons of mass destruction. So I would actually wish the panel to think about distinguishing between politicians making statements of fact or purported statements of fact that turn out to be false, the issue around Turkey and Syria you mentioned, for example, versus election promises. Now, when we talk about election promises, I think there's more ground for things to be different because nobody can predict the future. And it's absolutely right that further debt in de injection was needed in the economy in 2008 to avert absolute disaster. And I don't think it would be the business of judges to intervene in the decision to do exactly that. However, in <coughs> other areas of life, for example, in the fund management industry, if you're making a promise to your investors about your investment strategy and you completely, completely diverge from that strategy, you would expect the investors to have the opportunity to effectively come out of the fund. What options do we have as the electorate? And what do we have to make these politicians account for what they do? And if you read Tony Blair's books, he talks about effectively a form of dictatorship. We elect them, then for four years they do that, what they want. Mm -hmm. I think they should be held to okay. account. Thank you very much. Uh, what options, Dan? Yes, it's the essence of parliamentary democracy that we vote once every four years. I suppose you could have a Swiss system or a Californian system of constant referendums, but the experience is that those end up dominated by interest groups. You have so many questions uh, that, that it's hard to keep track of them unless you're, you're a full-time activist. Does it actually end up with more responsive politicians? I'd say it doesn't. So, so it's a cliche, but it's true. Democracy is a terrible system, but everything else is worse. OK, go ahead, Dan. Um, look, I'm very grateful for the question because what lies behind it is the very, very serious nature of asking the public what they think about complex matters and how you 
um, ensure that statements of fact are correct. Um, and actually, very seriously, is it the case that in the referendum that we've just seen, that frankly has left this country horribly divided, um, has seen an increase in hate crime across the country? I mean, you know, that a Polish man should lose his life just, just this week. This is very, very serious. And um, my sense is that there, there, there does need to be, uh, and maybe it's a new arbitrator, a new organization, but given what was said by the Electoral Reform Society yesterday, clearly things were said, in truth, on both sides that simply were not true. And in asking the public to make that determination, if you like, um, putting to one side parliamentary sovereignty <coughs> in which we genuinely debate and weigh up a number of things, I think that the point you've made is particularly serious and does require some new order. Now, that order is both within Parliament, because Parliament would have to legislate, and absolutely the judiciary. But my view is the consequences of the decision that we made on the 23rd of June are more significant than any decision in my lifetime. And the manner in which we are now moving to make that decision, and the nature on which we had that decision, which was really David Cameron trying to fix a problem on the right of his party, and really Boris Johnson seeking to become the next Prime Minister, um, um, and frankly the Labour Party being in a mess. All of those things have contributed to this point, as well as globalisation, as well as a failure in domestic policy on, for both governments that have led us to this place that require, actually, a serious look at what is said, certainly in relation to referendum. It strikes me that there is a fundamental difference in the types of elections so in a general election or a local election, you're talking about promises made by political parties, and there are other political parties that can scrutinise those claims. However, it was completely different in the referendum, where you had two campaigns which were officially appointed campaigns to which politicians of all parties could um, connect themselves. But they were, these were run by people who were not elected, who could not be brought before select committees, who could not be questioned in the House. And when you have that type of um, election, a referendum, it is far more vulnerable to the influences of money and megaphone. And I think what we saw in the referendum is that actually there was an enormous megaphone from the big newspaper groups where they repeated claims, particularly of one of the Leave campaign, and inflated those claims with very little or no scrutiny whatsoever, mm. and particularly no consequences. So actually, I see no role at all for, uh, for the court uh, or for lawyers uh, when it comes to the ordinary process of um, local and general elections. But in the case of a referendum, which is run by, which MPs are involved but are not effectively running it, and where you lack the levels of scrutiny that you have in Parliament, there should be something, and I think the public are crying out for it. I don't know whether it's an ombudsman or a beefed up returning officer officer or some kind of enormous crowdfunding campaign for full fact. I don't know, but the public does want something and there has to be some intervention. I don't think it's the courts. Yep, I mean, I think we haven't talked about the press and Daisy, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the, the press has been a gigantic megaphone distorter, even of the distorted messages put out by the politicians. And, uh, you know, getting some kind of grip on the press would be a good idea. And I strongly support hacked off and the Leveson, which looks as if, you know, goodness knows if it's ever going to happen. But it would help to bring a little bit of, uh, you know, practical sense back to, to, to the media. Um, but, uh, you, know, I th I, you know, I think you could have an arbiter. I think the Electoral Reform Society is right, you could. But the intervention of, of Andrew Dilnot, uh, the uh, chair of the UK Statistics, had no effect whatever. And he is about as important and powerful, you would think, as anybody could be, mm. uh, really a, 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 a man of authority, and they paid no attention at all. So yeah. I don't know how we give it teeth. The context for the debate, of course, is the broken promises that it's felt were made during the referendum debate. But of course, in a way, the, the irony is that the reason we found ourselves in the position of having the referendum was not because of a broken manifesto commitment, it was actually a kept manifesto commitment. Yeah. Uh, and so whilst I have considerable sympathy and, and, and feel the, the sentiment behind the frustrations with the way the referendum was run, in a way you can't complain with people playing the game the way the rules of the game are set up. And I think, in a way, to square the circle, if we're going to look at judicial oversight of parliament, 
it feels to me that a referendum is an abdication of responsibility by Parliament in its representative democracy. And I see no problem on a practical or on a constitutional level with the judiciary having oversight of decisions to promise a referendum on two options that they cannot guarantee they will be able to follow through on. Mm. Because in a way, that is the problem with it. The referendum on electoral reform, there was no concern, notwithstanding statements made on either side, that they would be able to follow through and deliver on the decision made in a plebiscite. The issue uh, here was that they couldn't guarantee they could follow through yeah, on the positions. Yeah, they didn't yeah. know what the positions were. You know, I, I'm going to... Let, let's use that as the, the platform for these final sort of one and a half minutes from each of them. I think that works well, actually. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in the same order as before. David, you're going to kick us off. Um, uh, Dan, you're going to finish up. You've got one and a half, two minutes. Just stay in your seats and g give us your final thoughts on this. Well, look, I ask you to think about the actors behind, frankly, the nature of this motion. Think about Boris Johnson and his face on the morning of the result and whether he genuinely believed in the arguments that he put forward. Think about Andrea Leadsom. Some might call her loathsome. I think that's a bit unfair. But um, think about her CV and the nature of her own veracity. Um, uh, and think about Michael Gove and the way he behaved um, um, to those loyal to him during the campaign. And ask yourself whether in this age of Twitter, of Facebook, in an age post expenses where <coughs> politicians are um, not trusted, frankly, um, uh, in ways perhaps they were in decades gone by, whether that there, there is a new room for a new arbiter and whether in fact that arbiter should be the judiciary we, we've got. Of course it would take quite a high threshold. Of course it could not be in every circumstance. Uh, and of course it would be a boon for our legal system. But we face, as I started, um, a serious constitutional crisis in this country. Uh, I don't want to live in a country in which an unelected prime minister, and I personally have had very good relations with Theresa May as Home Secretary, the work she's done on Stop and Search, the work we did together <coughs> post the riots, but I don't want to live in, the, in a country in which effectively an unelected prime minister is able to make the biggest decision that will affect my children and the country in which they grow up. And for that reason alone, the judiciary must now decide. All right. Polly, go ahead. Well, I'm in the odd position of agreeing with almost everything that David says, including hoping he'll win his case. But that's because it will bring the decision back to Parliament. I think referendums are an absolute disaster, and I hope the lesson from this is never again, no, no uh, referendums. I think the motion that's being proposed here is to turn every general election into a kind of mini referendum on a whole string of judiciable manifesto promises, each one of which becomes a kind of little referendum. And I'm absolutely appalled by that. In the end, politics is bigger, it's different, it's in a different realm. Uh, it doesn't live in the world of uh, the law court. Uh, it's about other things. It's about aspirations, it's about who we are, it's about identity, it's about representation. Uh, and I just think that I understand people have said, you know, how terrible politicians are and how much we must hold them to account. We must hold them to account, but we do it through politics and not through the courts. Okay. Polly, thank you very much indeed. Robert Palmer. I absolutely agree with uh, the various people from the floor who have drawn a line between referendums and, and general elections and said, look, different considerations apply in each. With a referendum, people make a lot of wild statements, their arguments, their statements of fact, they may be accurate or inaccurate, they're all designed to persuade someone to cast their vote for or against a specific uh, proposition. And I think the solution to wild inaccuracy in that form is very different from the solution to broken election promises made in the context of a manifesto pledge. I think a solution in the former context might well be, as the Electoral Reform Society suggested today, uh, a New Zealand-style model where they have effectively beast, beefed up the equivalent of their advertising standards authority, say, well, a bit of puff is all right, just like advertisers, but a blatant untruth you will not be permitted to repeat. Uh, and it needs to be a high threshold to not limit freedom of speech, but they, that doesn't mean there should be no threshold, and ultimately an injunction, uh, if necessary, uh, preventing someone from repeating a claim as part of a formal uh, campaign literature. Uh, so far as parliamentary elections are concerned, I've, I've, I've had my say. I, I don't need to repeat it, but I just say to Polly, we shouldn't be appalled at, at the idea that promises made 
as to who the government should be in a formal document such as manifesto should be expected to be respected or if they must be departed from that departure explained uh, before a court. It's a lovely idea that we could all have faith in parliamentary democracy and parliamentary democracy alone, but what we have learned is that simply isn't enough, and that's why we find ourselves in an era of post-trust politics. Okay, Robert, thank you. Danny. Mr Chairman, I think I'd be sceptical of the proposition that, that increased law or increased regulation it, it, it is going to give us a, a better, more beautiful political environment. In the referendum, I have a side interest in election where I was advising businesses, broadcasters, uh, trade unions <coughs> on what they could say legally in the constituents election. Well, the answer was not that much. And I said that to them. They said, how can that be the case? And the Daily Mail every day is coming out with essentially propaganda. And the answer is that they're exempt from these rules, but the whole panoply of election law bears on you. So maybe the answer isn't in fact to restrict the press, as Paul suggested, which I, I would shy away from at some speed. Maybe the answer is actually that all of that law, all of that regulation damaged it, right? it meant that voices were not heard, and that the BBC presented a neutral perspective on questions which factually it should not have been neutral on. So, so that's maybe a lesson how one should be careful of predicting that you'll get a particular political result from very wide ranging legislation. What really this legislation would look like in many ways is the landscape of our libel laws, which have been <coughs> amazingly effective in giving a right for people to protect their reputations as long as they are very litigious and very rich, but haven't really been a much benefit and have never been a benefit to, to ordinary people. So, so this is really taking our libel laws, taking that experience, the, the joyful alliance that Robert Maxwell and George Galloway has been able to place on them, and then expanding it to all of our politics. And I think that, despite the potential benefit for lawyers, it is a bad thing. Okay. Thank you very much indeed to uh, all of our speakers this evening. Uh, once again, we've had a, a, a really good discussion, a really good debate. Uh, I'm going to ask you to vote now. We'll take a look at these votes, see how you've been swayed. The fours, by the way, beforehand were 63%. The against were 11%. The undecided were 26 uh, I've got to say, the against have, uh, have done pretty well here. Let me just stand up and grab these. Agrees have fallen from 63 to 51 or thereabouts. <laughs> <laughs> Take a pause for breath here. You have done extremely well, Holly and uh, Dan. You are up to 45%. No, you haven't voted and I haven't voted either. You're up to 46%. Um, up from 11. And the other side has fallen to 6% from 26. You know, the motion... Motion's carried, I'm afraid. One percent was in it. Really good to say. Thank you very much.